much for coming to Racial Bias and the Bench. My name is Gary Young. I'm a former journalist and currently professor of sociology at the University of Manchester. And, you know, like Bruce Forsyth, I will be your host this evening. Um, uh, after a brief introduction from myself, I will pass on to uh, Esther Quinn. Uh, and then uh, we will hear four individual um, contributions uh, from uh, Abin Bola Johnson, Graham Ritchie, Katrina French, and Haroon Siddiqui, whom I will introduce each uh, as they, uh, just before they speak. We'll then um, uh, move to the um, comfy chairs for uh, a conversation uh, between ourselves uh, uh, and then open things up for questions from the floor before uh, calling on uh, Keir Monteith QC to close proceedings with some closing remarks. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for coming. I have, no one has alerted me that there will be any kind of fire drill this evening, so if the fire alarm goes off, it's for real. Um, uh, I've been warned that there is, uh, that the lift takes only one person, so um, the lift that you can't use, you can't use anyway. Um, now would be a good time to put your phones on mute um, uh, and um, uh, let's get on. So with the 1999 McPherson report into the murder of Stephen Lawrence, the framing of the underpinnings of British racism shifted quite fundamentally. Prior to its publication, the dominant establishment narrative centered on how to contain and mitigate the problems that non-white people cause by their very presence. The McPherson report, written by a white lord investigating the failings of an overwhelmingly white police force, introduced into the mainstream discourse the notion that the problem was not the presence of black people, but the presence of racism, which was embedded in our institutions and infected their practices. That the significance of this shift was manifold, but uh, for now I just want to concentrate on two counts. The first was that by positing racism as the problem, the McPherson report by inference suggested that anti-racism might be the solution. What seems like a small rhetorical point actually suggested a thoroughgoing and fundamental shift in perspective and vantage point. It reminds me of the words of Cadence Roth, the protagonist in an Armistead Mopen 1992 novel, Maybe the Moon, and she describes the challenges of being a little person. She says, when you're my size and you're not being tormented by elevator buttons, water fountains and ATMs, you spend your life accommodating the sensibilities of quote unquote normal people. You learn to bury your own feelings and honor theirs in the hope that they'll meet you halfway. It becomes your job and yours alone to explain, to ignore, to forgive over and over again. You do it if you want to have a life and not spend it being corroded by your own anger. You do it if you want to belong to the human race. Things looked different from where Cadence was standing. And prior to McPherson report, and even after it, all too often the emotional labor of empathy, of solidarity, of justice, of equality, how to get it, where we'd find it, fell primarily on those with the least power. It was us who had to see things from other people's point of view, even if we didn't like it, because otherwise it was gonna be impossible to fathom what was going on. Nobody ever asks me, when did you realize you were straight? The straight people are never asked that question. Nobody ever asked me, how did you balance being a foreign correspondent and having small children? Because no one asks men that question. And with McPherson and the shift from black people being the problem to racism being the problem, we started at least to ask the right question. And that shifted both the focus and the burden. Also, 
did what we were focusing on. It reframed our understanding from the individual to the institutional. It encompassed not just the obvious, but the abstruse as well. It showed that racism doesn't have one face, but many, and sometimes no face at all. It laid bare the fact that non-white people had been falling foul, not just of the law of the land, but the law of probabilities. Evidence that there is a persistent and consistent propensity to shove the powerless to the bottom of every available pile and not only leave them there, but blame them for being there as well. More likely to be stopped, search, arrested. Less likely to be a judge, policeman or prison officer. As time went on, there were few doubts or few people had doubts that racism existed, but even fewer people would actually say that they were racist. And so we had racism without racists. We had um, uh, subjects, uh, objects, but no subjects. So McPherson dispelled the impression that racism was a behavioral sickness, the work of people who are impolite or nasty or poorly educated and badly brought up, and instead drew a clear and at times direct link between racist boot boys and complacent pen pushers, between the black shirts and the blue helmets, thereby charting a path from the crudest forms of racism to the most well-concealed. Where race is concerned, I fear, that the tone and emphasis of the Equal Treatment Bench Book appears to seek to unlearn some of the lessons of McPherson. To take us back to a time when the assumption is that those with power, in this case uh, um, the judiciary, are white, fair, and occasionally, possibly, momentarily, uncharacteristically flawed. As a rule, this is not the experience of black and Asian people. The anthropological eye that it casts on its subject is problematic, except in the premise of stereotypes, only then to insist on possible exceptions. Its starting point appears to be not that racism within the judiciary exists and should be challenged and resisted, but that a fundamentally fair system guided by egalitarian principles at, uh, may at times fall below the high standards it has set itself. As a rule, this is not the experience of black and Asian people. And since the Equal Treatment Bench Book aims to lay out just how the rule should be applied, these illusions, omissions, and illusions matter. So I'd like you to join me in discussing the impact of the uh, Equal Treatment Bench Book on racial bias and the bench with uh, my esteemed uh, uh, group of uh, co-conspirators uh, from the judiciary, the civil society, academia, and journalism. And I start by uh, inviting my colleague from the University of Manchester, uh, Ethna Quinn, to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for being here, welcome. Um, thanks to Gary, thanks to Manchester University, to Bridget Byrne and the Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity, and to Garden Court. Uh, it's great to be here and have this moment to review the situation in the courts one year on from the publication of our report. Um, I want to briefly recap on the report's key findings and also to reflect on some of the actions since before we turn to our excellent panel. Uh, re report co-authors are here, um, Kia Monteith, of course, um, as we've already heard. Also, um, Remy Joseph Salisbury online, Erica Kane, our quants queen, is here, and Franklin Addo also. Um, so a special welcome to you and to the advisory board members who are, who are also present. Um, it, racial Bias on the Bench was a very collaborative effort um, and actually it's lovely for, for people to be assembled here because last year the report launch was um, online only so we are, it's exciting that we're assembled here. Our st starting point with the report project was an appraisal of the then newly launched five-year judicial um, diversity and inclusion strategy. 
uh, which is now a little over halfway through. On the face of it, the strategy looked inadequate to us in its language and objectives to address the problem of bias and marginalization in the courts. To find out more, and with our focus particularly on race, we conducted a survey last year of legal professionals, asking them about their perceptions and experiences of the legal system, focusing on the judiciary. We got over 370 responses. Of course, that's by no means representative of all views of lawyers, as we explain in our report. But it's clearly um, a fairly chunky number of legals offering quantitative and, in many cases, qualitative responses. And we did manage to reach a broad range of job roles and ethnicities. Um, for example, 57% uh, of those surveyed were white people, um, as this table shows from the report. What did the legal professionals say to us? Their survey responses were very concerning. Just to recap our central bar chart finding, uh, we asked about perceptions of the role of racial bias in the legal system on a scale of one to five, with uh, one being no role and five being fundamental role. An overwhelming 95% said that racial bias plays a role in the legal system. And of those, almost 30% said that racial bias plays a fundamental role in the system. So the lawyer's responses then, as you can see, concentrate on the right-hand side of the chart. Many respondents offered written comments to um, over 120 of them, and the comments were consistent with the overall figures. They correlated with what we found on this bar chart. A few respondents commented on anti-racist practices, um, they'd seen by individual judges, that, that's to say, practices that protect against racism. Um, and it's very interesting to hear that McPherson has that already in his report, as Gary was saying, as a suggestion. We had a definition of anti-racism in our report. This was something we'd explicitly asked about uh, from the legal professionals. So those responses were encouraging. Um, here's one indicative one. I've seen lots of judges behave in what I consider to be a racist way over time. Equally, I've seen many who go out of their way to be anti-racist. But such observations were the exception. Here are three more representative ones. In essence, the legal system is rife with an undercurrent of racism. No hijab-wearing women being recruited as lawyers and into the judiciary. I have seen many instances where the pain and suffering of black people at the hands of the state is trivialized by judges. The, these were just a few short ones to give a flavor. Many more were much more detailed and there were dozens and dozens. We tried to capture quite a lot of them in the report, but we just didn't have room uh, uh, for many of them. Altogether, they were quite shocking, really. Our survey indicated that the most targeted groups for judicial bias were black and Asian people, and by far the single most mentioned group facing bias was young black male defendants, and joint enterprise injustice came up uh, explicitly and several times. Comments also suggested that when discrimination by judges was towards legal professionals, it tended to target black and brown women lawyers. A good number of the comments we received explained how complaints about racism um, come to be shut down by judges. The mention of racial bias or racism in the courtroom is treated by the judge or magistrate as boring or rude or implausible or unacceptable. I have a couple of examples. When the mixed race young man, through his advocate, attempted to explain why he felt the police officers had acted in a racist manner, the judge refused to hear these submissions. Judges are routinely ignorant and dismissive of issues pertaining to race, often asserting, we don't see colour. When judges take a dismissive approach to complaints of racism, it becomes very hard to challenge. This is what Leslie Thomas Casey, who wrote our report forward, calls racial silencing in the courts. And it's something much further back that McPherson identified as part of his very definition of institutional racism. Uh, he said, it persists, he quotes, it persists because of the failure of the organization openly and adequately to recognize and address its existence. The denial and discounting of racial bias allows that bias to fester and embed itself as racism in the norms and assumptions of the sector. And this denialism dovetails with what we and others have found to be a largely dysfunctional process for judicial complaints and appeals. 
Altogether, then, we offered wide-ranging findings um, in our executive summary. I've only touched on some. These findings are consistent with and support numerous other compelling recent reports on race and racism in the legal system. Indeed, collectively, we now have a very substantial body of data, sometimes using different terminology, all, um, but all basically pointing to the same direction. In our case, with our particular focus on the judiciary, having identified what we characterized as a multi-pronged problem, our recommendations insist on the need for multi-pronged solutions, and Kia will pick up on a few of these uh, in a bit. But I want to turn finally to one of our recommendations, recommendation six, which has to do with revising the equal treatment bench book, which is something that Gary has already um, touched on. The bench book is the equalities manual given to all judges and magistrates on their appointment and a reference point uh, in judicial college training programs. I want to stress that at, at over 500 pages, it contains a lot of detailed material that helps judges who consult it um, to be fair in aspects of their work. And we did get a couple of survey comments voicing appreciation of this document, which we included in our report. However, we believe the bench book crystallizes the wider problem of racial silencing that I've described, um, no doubt unconsciously. Uh, what we found in the bench book were some uh, unreliable assumptions and troubling blind spots in the treatment of race. We highlighted three. The bench book's lack of concerted coverage of racism faced by black people. It's starting assumption that presented most judges as already inherently fair and wise. And what we saw as its misunderstanding of certain fundamental cognitive bias processes. Our recommendation six was to address these criticisms. Now, the bench book is a live document, regularly updated, but uh, so far there's been no revision in light of our recommendation. Uh, so this summer, in 2023, we turned to nine leading race experts to ask their opinion and use their responses to write a letter to the bench book editors in advance of their next significant update of the document, which uh, comes out uh, early next year. One of the experts is the 2023 winner of the Orwell Prize for Journalism, Gary Young, uh, our chair, uh, uh, and he's already mentioned uh, the bench book. Um, I'll now share a couple of comments from other experts responding to a passage in the bench book on how to avoid stereotyping. Um, that, sorry, that's, uh, that's the three-page uh, part of, our, of our, uh, the critique of the bench book in our report. Um, responding to a passage in the bench book on how to avoid stereotypes, Professor Anton Emanuel, head of the Workforce Race Equality Standard in the NHS, explained that the passage actually risks reproducing stereotypical thinking, ascribing common characteristics to all individuals in a socially defined group is flawed, he said. A similar point was made by other experts, including Ragi, Ko uh, Ragi Kotak, head of Jedi Consultancy, Shireen Daniels, head of HR Rewired, and Dr. Shabna Begum, the co-head of the Runnymede Trust. Dr. Begum reminds us why this is imp so important. The power of the judiciary is tremendous, she says, and judicial racism has life-changing impacts on black and minority ethnic individuals and communities. Head of the Race Equality Foundation, Jabir Butt, OBE, again capturing comments made by others, said, without modifications, the bench book perpetuates the biases of the existing system. It's very important to understand that we don't mean to single out the bench book as the problem. The bench book is merely a useful example of unconscious racial silencing and a shortfall in racial literacy in the sector. So it's certainly not a matter of saying that fixing this document will fix the problem, because it's not particularly a bench book problem. In fact, we're more saying that even the Equalities Manual for Judges reproduces some of the problems because these problems are systemic. So I'd like to um, end with the words of the, another of our experts from this summer, the head of the Institute of Race Relations, Liz Fiquette. Uh, and Liz uh, offers um, this systemic critique and also a, a call to, to action. Today, more than ever, as report after report demonstrates unfair and disproportionate outcomes for BME people within the justice system, judicial complacency over institutional racism in its own ranks needs to be challenged. Thank you.
Thank you, Esther. I want to uh, apologize because I, I failed at my very first real task, which was to introduce you. <laughs> it's a bit late now, but uh, Esther is a professor in humanities at the University of Manchester, an academic lead, co-author of the report Racial Bias on the Bench, and the author of an award-winning scholarly book on institutional racism in the cultural industries, and led the AHRC research report, Prosecuting Rap, Criminal Justice and UK Black Youth Expressive Culture, having served for many years as an expert of rap evidence in the English and Welsh courts. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Abimbola Johnson from Doughty Street Chambers. Uh, Abimbola Johnson is an award-winning human rights barrister who practices from Doughty Street Chambers. She was called to the bar by the Inner Temple in 2011. Uh, she's also a legal commentator and writer, featured in most main media outlets. Her writing appears on the reading list for the LSE's uh, Law Honours course, and she delivers an annual lecture to Oxford University law graduate students on hate crime and discrimination. Abimbola sits on a number of boards and advisory panels. She's trustee for the Advocacy Academy, an editorial board member of the Criminal Law Review, management committee member of the Black Barristers Network and a board member for an ethical oversight panel at York University. Avin Bola, thank you. Hi everyone, this is, this, these aren't my slides, just um, ignore that. Um, I don't have any slides to address you with today. Uh, but I was asked just to speak for five minutes, each of us on the panel. Um, about our reflections in relation to the report. And I have to say that one of my first reflections with it was that there had been two reports in two Novembers, um, each successively prior to the publication of this one, which really laid the foundations for a lot of the findings from the team at Manchester. In November 2020, the Black Barristers Network that I sit on the management committee for ran a survey. There were 512 practicing black barristers at the time, over 100 of them responded to our call out. And during that, we were able to establish that more black barristers had reported experiences of racism from judges, magistrates, and panel members than from other lawyers, that while the majority of barristers said that their relationship with solicitors either had been or might have been negatively affected by race, a much larger majority said that this was true of their experiences before the bench. The statistics continued, with people highlighting that they felt that their work had been negatively affected by race, that they had been inappropriately treated or were patronised by uh, judges. That included being belittled, being undermined, experiencing microaggressions, being silenced in court, being overlooked. They highlighted concerns around allocation of work, career progression and retention at the bar. The following November, the Bar Council published a report called Race at the Bar, and the data in that report categorically and definitively <coughs> evidenced, both in quantitative and qualitative terms, that barristers from all ethnically minoritised backgrounds, especially black and Asian women, face systemic obstacles to building and progressing a sustainable and rewarding career at the bar. And based on that evidence, they concluded that black barristers and students would be their initial focus to ensure that those who were coming through the ranks wouldn't continue to feel the racism that was felt by those of us who were already in the profession. They recommended a number of key recommendations and findings, much of which echo the findings in this report. So I guess I think a lot of us who are at the bar came away from reading this report and thought, we know. What's next? This reflects our experiences We've been knowing this for a number of years, and what is the bar actually going to do in response? I have to say that if you were to ask me to highlight a specific instance of racism that I had experienced during the course of my career, I wouldn't be able to tell you. No one is so bold as to say to me that the reason that they have discriminated against me is because I'm black, or even to tell me that I'm being discriminated against. I think that highlights a point that Gary addressed during his initial introduction, which is that the solutions to this need to rest in systemic and institutional change, rather than relying on individuals 
being able to highlight, raise and complain about specific instances of racism because you'll always make sure by doing that that people fall short of having to enter into arguments, discussions, justifications of their own experiences and can be worn down by those processes. I have to say as well that we have disproportionality in our own misconduct proceedings in relation to barristers. So the idea of pushing for us as individuals to raise complaints when we see behaviour by the judiciary means that we would be using a system that, frankly, a lot of us don't believe in and have also seen patterns of discrimination which are repeated by a lot of the findings in this report. So the bar has responded. It's put in a number of measures in place. There are race equality committees that uh, exist. There's training. There's encouragement by chambers to look at their allocation of work. There are a number of race action plans that exist to try to push people to um, look at be becoming anti-racist, as has been described. But one of my concerns is that as a barrister, as somebody who worked for over a decade in the criminal justice system, predominantly in defence, where the majority of my clients, or disproportionate number of my clients at least, were from black backgrounds, not once did I have to demonstrate any knowledge of racism, of the state of racism in this country, of any of the language or vocabulary that should be used. Not once did I receive any mandatory training specifically to look at how to bring in anti-racism approaches into the court. And when you do, on occasion, try to do that, very often you're met with obstacles. For example, relying on an expert in uh, racism. You have to even be able to establish that that is somebody who has admissibility, somebody who has the required expertise. You need to establish before an often all-white courtroom why it is that that goes towards any of the issues which are live in the case. Whereas the reality is that what we are arguing is that the very structure and the fundamental basis of the systems that we are working in are themselves racist. So the manifestation of racism in the judiciary should come as no surprise because it's present from the very outset of our careers at the bar. So I do welcome um, this uh, report and I look forward to the discussion that we'll have as a panel. But I guess what the point that I'm trying to make is it is reflective of the overall system that falls short of looking at these matters. Another area of work that I concentrate on is that I chair a board, the Independent Scrutiny and Oversight Board that Katrina French sits on with me, where we are looking at the implementation of an anti-racism plan across England and Wales for all police forces who have signed up to it. And if I tell you that reading this report and the recommendations in this report mirror exactly the recommendations that we've raised in that work, mirror almost exactly the patterns of racism that you see in policing and other institutions, I think it highlights to many of us who work in these matters that these really are just reflections of society and until we come up with societal explanations, solutions and radical ways of thinking around how we can resolve these matters, we're just going to see another report next November setting out further racism at the bar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Abambola. Uh, uh, next, we have Graham Ritchie, Deputy Director of Policy for the Crown Prosecution Service. Graham um, has responsibility for CPS policy work on violence against women and girls, defendants, and inclusion and community engagement. This includes working with criminal justice and third sector partners to develop and implement various policy initiatives in the CPS. Prior to joining the CPS, Graham worked for the Children's Commissioner for England, where he was head of policy, working to protect children's rights. In this role, he worked on child protection and child sexual abuse policy. Graham has also worked in policy roles in child exploitation and online protection, command of the NCA. NCA, sorry. Uh, Graham, come on. Thank 
you, Gary. Uh, good evening, all. Um, first of all, I'd like to extend my thanks to the organisers of this event for inviting the CPS to participate. And I'd also like to congratulate the team behind the research, which is of the highest quality, and I can't think of a more important issue to be discussing this evening. Um, now, I might not be able to speak on behalf of all criminal justice agencies, but I do very strongly believe that for the Crown Prosecution Service, it's extremely important that we are accountable for our role in a criminal justice system which produces disproportionate outcomes for black defendants and other minoritized groups. So I'll focus my uh, remarks on the findings from the, the research that's been done and how that then relates to the CPS position and a bit about the past for the CPS, where we are now and what we need to do next. So first, the past. Now, in 2001, uh, against a backdrop of the Sir William McPherson uh, inquiry into the racist murder of Stephen Lawrence, and indeed against uh, a background of uh, several employment tribunal claims for racism, uh, the CPS commissioned a review of racism in the organisation, uh, which was undertaken by Sylvia Denman. Uh, and at the same time, the Council for Racial Equality also reviewed CPS uh, policies and practice and both reviews reached the same broad conclusion the CPS had a problem with racism um, now the director of public prosecution who heads up the CPS uh, at the time that was David Calvert Smith and he was unequivocal in his view that the CPS was institutionally racist and it had to change um, and it has done so, I would say. I think if I reflect on the CPS today, it's quite different from the CPS of 20 years ago, and some progress has been made. So the workforce of the CPS is very different from 20 years ago. Uh, we're now one of the most, if not the most, diverse organisation in the civil service. 22% uh, of our workforce has a black or ethnic minority background. That compares with about 14% uh, and yet as an average in the civil service. 9% uh, of our senior leaders, similarly, that compares with uh, about 8% in the civil service as a whole. And most importantly for me, of all the legal trainees we've appointed since 2016, about 29% of them have a black or ethnic minority background, and they're the future of the CPS. So we're working to build that pipeline to our senior leadership. Um, and when we look at our people survey scores, that's the kind of well-being survey which is done annually within the civil service, uh, our black and ethnic minority employees report a positive experience of working for us. Now, that's all well and good, but there's a big problem around disproportionate outcomes in the criminal justice system, and the CPS plays a part in that. Uh, so we have made disproportionality uh, one of our strategic priorities. Now, if you cast your mind back to around 2017, when the David Lammy review of disproportionality in the criminal justice system was published. Uh, David Lammy's review was very good. There was a, a chapter which focused specifically on the CPS. And his view, based on the data that he had seen, was that there was no disproportionality in CPS charging decisions. Um, and also he was uh, very positive about some of the other work we do around uh, independent scrutiny, so our hate crime scrutiny panels, for example. However, it was very much our view at the time that uh, as good as the Lamy review was, that actually there was further work that could be done to properly explore uh, disproportionality in our charging decisions, which could be done in a much more detailed and rigorous way. So we decided to commission independent academic research on that subject. We worked with uh, a team from Leeds University, and they looked at almost 200,000 uh, charging decisions CPS charging decisions, not police, but our decisions, um, over the past three years or so. And they did a regression analysis. Now, you don't need to be a statistician to understand that. Effectively, what they were doing was they looked at the influence of different variables on the decision to charge. And the variable we were most interested in is the racial background of the suspect in the case. And what they found was that there is disproportionality in CPS decision making. And that was present in all CPS areas and across all defence types that we could look at. So there is a problem with disproportionality in CPS decision making. Now what the Leeds research couldn't tell us is what's causing that, though I think we can all hazard a guess. So 
Uh, that takes me through to where we are now and where we are going in the future. We are kind of midway through uh, a comprehensive and very detailed program of research to understand the drivers of disproportionality in CPS decision making. And there are three particular strands to that. One is looking at the relationship between the diversity of our workforce and disproportionality in our charging decisions. So effectively exploring the hypothesis that our least diverse areas are perhaps most disproportionate in their decision making. We're also looking uh, at some of the factors which might influence our decision making in far more detail. So one of the, the factors that the Leeds team were unable to, to, to take into consideration was previous convictions. Now we know in a criminal justice system which produces disproportionate outcomes. That means that black defendants who come back in for a charging decision are more likely to have previous convictions and effectively there is a vicious circle. So we want to understand what that effect looks like as well. And the most interesting for me is uh, a study that we're doing with Aston University. Uh, it's a corpus linguistic study and effectively we're looking at the language used in case files. And what we're really interested in is whether the language used for black defendants is different from the language that might be used for white defendants for comparable offences. And we'll be looking at the language used by police in the files that they give us, and we'll be looking at the language used by our prosecutors and their reviews of those cases. And what we're looking to find out is do we use more detailed descriptions, stronger language, uh, more demonstrative language uh, for black defendants? Uh, as opposed to, to white defendants. And overall, that package of research will really help us to understand the role of racism and racial bias uh, in that process of charging. And then it will help us inform how we really target our efforts to address it. So I think the CPS has come some way since 2001. I think that there is very clearly work that still needs to be done. Uh, and we are now working on that. Now, when I entered the building earlier this evening and I spoke to the security guard outside and he said, well, where, where are you from? And I said, the Crown Prosecution Service. And he said, oh, the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's part of the problem, right? Please don't look at us as the enemy. We want to be partners in the solution. That's why we are investing so much of our time in this. And that's why we've made it a strategic priority. So we're very keen to work across the system as a whole to address the, the issues that Etna summarised uh, earlier this evening. So we're very grateful for the invitation and very happy to take any questions during the discussion later. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Graham. Uh, next is Katrina French. Uh, Katrina, um, who has a long-standing commitment to racial equality and social justice, is the founding director of Unjust CIC. In 2015, Katrina began volunteering to provide community scrutiny to policing of the policing power of stop and search. For three years, she chaired Islington Stop and Search Community Monitoring Group, and she also held the vice chair and chair positions of the mayor's office for policing and crime pan London stop and search community monitoring network. That is a mouthful. Um, formerly the chief executive of Stopwatch, a national research and action organization specializing in stop and search policing, Katrina has overseen the publication of several evidence-based reports. She's a trustee of Transform Drug Policy Foundation, a board member of, and a board member of the Independent Scrutiny and Oversight Board established to oversee the implementation of the National Police Race Action Plan. Katrina, please. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. I'd like to begin by thanking the authors of the report, really timely report, although Abby says something similar comes out every year and I want them to continue coming out until we have a different system. So I really implore the, the authors of the report and the organisers of this event this evening. Um, I wanted to reflect on just how similar all the systems are in terms of the racism and the brokenness. 
Um, it's not often that black people are part of the 1% club in terms of them only being 1% of judges. So that was quite amazing because usually the 1% is like the billionaires. Here we are in the judiciary is the 1%. Um, as the founder of an organisation focused on challenging racial discrimina discrimination in the criminal legal system, we started off saying justice. And I found myself having to explain why the system is not full of justice so we actually scrapped it and if you see it, it's old branding it's now the criminal legal system and um, it made me think in my time of doing this where have people come to me and said there's been hot spots of um, crime and it's usually certain boroughs I'm not going to name them but if you think about you see a lot of police presence that's it but there's also where there's hot spots of um, dare I say a bit dodgy judges so Kingston Court I've been told I don't know <laughs> Woolwich, I've been told. <laughs> Highbury and Islington a bit on a bad day. But it, it got me thinking of the need to have transparency and accountability um, for judges. Because actually, these are people that are held in high esteem by society. And when they're emboldened and allowed to shut down valid arguments about race, but also to perpetuate racism, we then have a jury and a gallery that leaves probably slightly more racist if we're really honest about the impact of language. And that's why um, I really welcomed what Graham had just said about looking at what's being said in the files because it's easy to look at the numbers, but actually some of the research that's going on in the U US at the moment with body-worn footage of police officers is looking at how officers address people. Do they say, good afternoon, ma'am, or get out the effing car? <laughs> you know, what's the language being used? Because that can be an illustration of the disdain or the, the, the lack of compassion that's going to come from this encounter. So I'm really um, elated to hear that the CPS is looking at the language because it's not just that that is a big part of the encounter, how we speak to people. Communication is the bedrock of society, often been told by my mum. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, and judges are in a, a, very a very important position about not just what they say, but how they interpret evidence that's given to them. So just drawing on some of my reflections, we're around that joint enterprise. And more recently, in recent years, the use to diminish patois or language that is used by young youths as though they're feral or uneducated, when actually it's just the words of the time. You know, it's their language. It's just how they used to communicate. It's not an indication of guilt, illiteracy. And even in cases where some young people may actually have some developmental issues, some of those aren't even being allowed to be admitted because they're seen as not being important. So you're damned if you are at a bind and vulnerable, and you're damned if you're not because you use or behave in a way which is deemed to be subculture. And I think this goes back to Stuart Hall. So once again, I, I welcome the report because unfortunately nothing has changed. And whilst nothing changes, we have to continue to have the same conversations and to advocate for the change that we seek to come into place. Another thing running a, a non-profit organisation, we have a legal group at Unjar Shout, some of the lawyers here on Shout, Rajiv, we're funded by Garden Corp, thank you. Um, but was people saying we have difficulty running race arguments. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, just say it. And they're like, well, we can't. Like, we want to. A, there's an issue with some white lawyers not feeling competent and com comfortable enough to run those arguments. But there's also, who, how do I put bread on my table? Because I want to have a long career. I don't want to be seen as somebody who's a troublemaker. I'm like, I ain't got a problem with that. Let's make some trouble. But in the profession, I can understand that if you are wanting to be like that. And it makes me reflect. as I'm, I have to think of the similarities between policing, because we often just look at policing and prisons. But that bit in the middle is kind of just seen as being okay because it's the judges, it's the lawyers, it's the qualified people, it's the educated people. It's not the kind of, dare I say, and this is not me, the stigma of being a police officer or a prison guard is not the same esteem in society as being a barrister or a judge. So it's kind of left untouched. And I think we really need to question that because what we see in the Metropolitan Police is we now have a commander who was there for many, many years and is in retirement and been brought back. I don't really understand why, because if you've retired, you should just kind of retire off nicely, especially if you're part of the organisation 20 years ago when it was just as racist as it is now, according to um, Louise Casey. But what happens then is the people at the bottom kind of 
monkey see, monkey do, replicate those behaviours. So we have, unfortunately, then, barristers and solicitors, because of their wanting to go where they are, will just be silent. And evil persists when good people do nothing. And silence is an action. You know, it is part of the problem, is the silence. But I can understand why people are silent, similarly, in the police force. So there's something here about saying that we want people to call stuff out, but actually you call it out, you don't have a job anymore. Where do you go? This is your profession. So I think we need to be bold and brave about how do we imagine systems where we don't have a judiciary, like how we have them. What does a new system in 2023 look like? What does the 22nd century look like? Why are we holding on to those really old relics? No, I don't mean the people, no disrespect. <laughs> but I think we really need to be bold because these systems and institutions are broken. And I know it's very difficult, but I think of like Harriet Tubman when she saw herself free and she saw a situation that many people just could not see. So we have to really think, what are we holding on to? Because I think if we hold on to these institutions, we will unfortunately continue to get the outcomes that we get because this is how and when they were built and they thrive on difference and division. And that's not necessarily because they're bad people. It's just because they're not around lovely people like us. Um, uh, what else did I think? Uh, perpetuations of black people. So I just want to draw on just a couple of reflections. It was no surprise that they said they've seen racism because people have said in summing up, the judge has referred to language or even just behaviour. And I have a real fear, I'm going to call it out now, with the introduction of the screens in the courtroom, is it really dehumanises people? Um, and judges, I'd even want someone to do research if we get there, how many times did the judge even look at the defendant? Because when you're on the screen, it's like watching TV, you just flick, your eyes glaze over. So I think for people in the profession, some of the technological advances that are going to come in will be really detrimental to racialized communities and black people. And we really need to be in innovative and creative about thinking what about some of those harms are, not wait for them to happen, but kind of envisage what they will be. Because I don't think... Um, not having somebody in the room. Energy is so powerful. So being able to see somebody there um, in front of you is very different from having them on the screen, although we already know that judges misinterpret that you know, young black men are not remorseful because they're not, uh, crying all the time and demonstrating remorse like that. But I do think the presence of a person in a room carries energy and we should really hold on to that in holding judges to account in some of their decisions. Um, the elephant in the room is there's no such thing as racism, so they say there's clearly such things as racism, and whilst they continue to deny it, we must continue to not be gaslit and to call it out. All of the research, I think this was something that got me thinking, is how can unjust as an organisation look at the ju judiciary and do some sort of research and bring to light some of the problems and advocate on that? Because we look at policing and we're looking at prisons, what's the bit around the judges? Um, and because... I say this all the time, we do need to have a more transparent um, and accountable complaint system. That is something that's important. People have to talk out. If we don't speak about it, it gets pushed under the carpet. So for the people that are called, and everyone's called because it's the bar, but for the people that are really, really called to call out what's going on at the bar, we need to make sure that there's systems there to protect them and that those systems are robust, and they also have external scrutiny. But if I'm really honest, I'm in the phase of reforming hasn't worked, and we really need to think about recreating, and it doesn't mean tearing things down as we do it, it means creating the new ways of thinking and challenging the norms that have got us into this current situation. So I'm going to end by saying thank you to the authors. This has really got unjust thinking as a civil society organisation. How do we hold the judici judiciary to account? The police are always getting a... They're not really getting a good old hiding, really. But considering, compared to some of the other elements of the criminal legal system, I think it's incumbent on civil society to continue holding them to account. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Katrina. Let's make travel. I like that. Uh, uh, and finally, my uh, former and um, uh, fond colleague, uh, former colleague, who I only just learned I've been pronouncing his name wrong for the last two decades, um, Harun Sadiq who is The Guardian's legal affairs correspondent and has been since 2021, 
finally putting um, his law degree from the University of Manchester uh, to some use. Uh, he's been at The Guardian for more than 15 years, having previously been a reporter and then senior reporter. Uh, in 2021, he was longlisted for the Orwell Prize for Journalism for a series of articles about how and why black Britons suffer unequal outcomes at the hands of the police. That is no mean feat to be shortlisted for that award when you are a general reporter, I can tell you. Uh, in the same year, he was one of the organisers of a letter to the Society of Editors, criticising a statement which denied the presence of racism in the newspaper industry. Uh, Haroon is the current journalist director of the Scott Trust, which owns The Guardian. Haroon, please. Thanks, Gary. Uh, the last person who called me Sadiq at a public event was Matt Hancock, but, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to hold, hold that against you. He, he actually called me later that evening to apologise, uh, so, you know, feel free to... Um, so, I really wanted to follow on uh, quite, uh, I think, from what Katrina said and, and talked about why the judiciary aren't held accountable and, and from my perspective as a journalist. And I think we saw that quote, I think it was Shabna Mahmood, the, the Runnymede Trust, and she said that judicial racism is life-changing, and yet they're not really held to account. You know, this, this, this report is, is very valuable in trying to do so. As Abin Bola said, there have been other reports, and it still doesn't happen. I think one of the reasons is we, we do pride ourselves on open justice in this country, and we largely do have open justice. But the fact is, uh, there aren't journalists there, there aren't independent observers, so no one really knows what's going on. And I think a useful comparator is the police. I think, you know, probably most of the people in this room have known for decades that the police are racist. But I think the understanding at a general level has been enhanced by, well, one, camera phones, the, the sharing of stuff on social media, and occasionally, if we're very lucky, the police will switch on their body-worn cameras when they're supposed to, and that will also provide evidence. I was recently covering the Bianca uh, Williams um, case, and that, that was a case in point where they put the footage on after, you know, in, in hours after it happened. I think Linford Christie, who was her coach, actually did it, and that immediately became a big story. Now, you don't have that with judges. We don't have cameras in courts. So you're relying on a journalist being there fortuitously and, you know, recording it, or you're relying on one of the lawyers who's appearing bringing it up. And there's a, there's a lot of problems with that. I think Avin Bola talks about them. You know, it's, it's, you know, one of the things is it can be career-limiting, but it's also very difficult because at the end of the day, if you complain what's the evidence it's a tr it's a transcript and for example I think it was in the report one of the examples was a judge saying you people now you can just imagine that if you that then goes to you know a disciplinary hearing the judge is going to say I didn't mean you people black people I meant you people as in you know people who do these terrible things so I think that's that's an important reason why judges aren't held accountable. And, and in fact, the only real judicial scrutiny we see in, in the press tends to be from a right-wing agenda. So it's generally, it will be, oh, they've, um, you know, the sentences, aren't tough, the sentences aren't tough enough in this particular case is one thing. And then in civil cases, particularly judicial review, you get you know, activist judges, oh, you know, woke judges, etc., cetera, which, which is not helpful at all. And th there's two things I want to say on the kind of portrayal of judges in the media in this fashion. Well, one is that, and I think this is mentioned in the report, no one really takes responsibility. The government don't take responsibility because they say the judiciary are independent. But as we know from these articles about sentencing, about judicial review... Ministers are quite happy to intervene when they want to. So they do have, they do have certain powers. Yes, we, don't, we do want an independent judiciary, 
But if you can interfere and say, oh, this judge hasn't imposed a harsh enough sentence, or this judge is acting as an activist judge in this Brexit case, then sure as hell you can intervene and say, well, there, there is racism in the judiciary and we need to do something about that. And the other thing I wanted to say about that is this kind of right-wing portrayal of judges it is also just ludicrous that, you know, they're activist judges or they're too soft. We know from judicial statistics that the judges are overwhelmingly white, they're, they're mainly male, they are, I think they're, they're, yeah, they're overwhelmingly over 50, and the Sutton Trust found that, um, I've got nothing against age, I'm, I'm going to be 50 next year, so, um, uh, and the Sutton Trust said two-thirds are, I think, privately educated. Now, obviously, not everyone who is a white male who's privately educated, who's over 50, is going to be biased, but that, you know, this, this idea that somehow judges are activist judges is, you know, with that demographic, I'm sorry, it just doesn't ring true. And I think, you know, this, the, they have this judicial diversity strategy, but as, as they say in the report, they kind of talk about increasing diversity, and obviously that's a good thing, but this fact that they shy away from saying why they're doing it is really important. It's about tackling racism, and, you know, we've talked about some of the stereotypes to do with, um, you know, rap music, language, and stuff, and that's why it's important to have judges who, you know, might share a similar background, but, you know, it's not enough at the same time. And training is another thing that was picked up on. And I think that's really important because, as we've, as we've seen in certain sort of public institutions that I'm not going to name and shame, having a few black and brown faces doesn't always lead to an a anti-racism perspective. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to conclude by saying, you know, the Lord Chief Justice response, I thought, in this respect was, was not helpful. It was kind of, you know, these, the, these are a few hundred responses, these are not representative. And I think the report made, you know, very plain that you couldn't just extrapolate this. But as, as a journalist, I know that, you know, obviously your gold standard article is where you've got a huge sample of people, but it's difficult to do in some arenas. And when, when you have those voices speaking up and, and you know, it's, it's difficult for people to speak up, you need to respect those and you need to do something. And I, I think, and, and, it, and the other thing that mentioned in the report is that the judiciary has not published its own report into judicial bullying and racism. So I think it's, I think it's really, you know, not, not good for the Lord Chief Justice to be kind of dismissive of it when you've got this evidence and you've got people speaking up. And I think, you know, it's time for the judiciary and the government to both own this subject and do something about it. Um, thank you, um, Harun. If um, the other panellists can join me... Um, Graham, if you sit there, then we are boy, girl, boy, girl. Um, it is um, um, worrying to know that I am in the same company as Matt Hancock. Um, but there you, there you go. Uh, thanks for that. Um, it was also, interestingly, in that same Sutton Trust report, what it revealed was that um, one group that was even more elite than... Um, uh, judges was newspaper columnist, um, uh, which uh, once again, there you go. Um, I am going to ask a uh, because um, uh, we're behind on time, and I do want to give you in the audience a chance to ask questions. I'm going to put out a few notions, uh, and I, I just want you to respond to the ones that you feel like responding to. You don't have to respond to them all. Uh, and also, please, respond to each other. That's when panels actually 
um, really get going. The, the first was uh, my first observation really started with you, um, uh, but then went throughout, which was a quote from Sven Lindquist in uh, Exterminate All the Brutes, where he said, you already know enough, so do I. It's not knowledge we lack. What's missing is the courage to understand what we know and to draw conclusions. This notion, once again, uh, uh, and th this doesn't disparage the report at all, but it says, once again, we have a report which tells us what we are experiencing, and we know what we're experiencing, and yet um, uh, somehow, even though we keep saying it, and even though they keep finding it, nothing changes, or all too little changes. I do want to ask, is it nothing changes, or... Um, are, are we talking about insufficient change or cosmetic change? Um, I do also want to throw out the, uh, the question, and this would work for all of you, but I think particularly you, um, Graham, of can this system reform itself? Is that a meaningful request? Um, that if the problem is as deep-seated and embedded and institutional and systemic as it is, can we expect the system to actually change itself? And if not, then what will be the external factors that, um, uh, that force uh, that change? And that, finally, to reflect on a point that you made, uh, Katrina, where you said reforming hasn't worked. Um, from my days in student politics, the distinction was always between reform and revolution, um, but that was student politics. Um, if we're not talking about reform, then what are we talking about? Um, and I, obviously, I'm not expecting you to give all of the answers here, but if we're looking for fundamental, and you were looking more than a century ahead, if we're looking, if, if, which is great, if we have a lodestar, then how, how do... Um, how do we get there? Um, so, um, th is there anyone wants to start on, on any of those? You don't have to, please don't feel the need to kind of talk about all of them. Can I start with your question Thank you. um, around kind of whether things have changed or is it that nothing has changed? Um, so, in both factors and both kind of facets of my work, whether that's court based or doing the police scrutiny work that I do, the initial hurdle nearly always is getting on everyone in the room on the same page about what we're talking about when we discuss racism. So I thought it was really important that the first recommendation of this report is highlighting its anti-racism work and institutional racism. And I think that people feel very uncomfortable in this country talking about institutional racism because what they want racism to be is, oh, if you're not a nice person and you call someone a nasty name, and you do it intentionally, that's racist. Everything else is unconscious bias, or it's ignorance, or you know, it's, uh, it's unintentional, and, and it can be kind of mediated and mitigated in that way. Whereas when you talk about institutional racism, you are talking about active racism, but you're also having to analyse procedures, processes, and measuring yourself up to a set of metrics which holds you accountable. It's, a, it's more complex and it requires answers that really shine a light on things that we've taken for granted for centuries. It means accepting the institutions that to be British we are meant to be proud of and revere. It means that actually we accept that the foundation of those are inherently discriminatory and it means that there's a lot of reflection and work that needs to go into that. And I think that simultaneously there's also a difference in the expectations. As people become more well-read, as they build on the work of generations before them, our own subjective expectations of what it looks like to be anti-racist develop, and the solutions need to match up with that. They need to catch up to what those things look like, and they will always be behind, because you always have to take the work, go back, discuss it round a table, come up with a policy, implement it, and by the time that policy comes out, it's already outdated compared to where people are at. And what I see a lot of in the legal profession is a lot of that work, that anti-racism work or the diversity work, it falls on barristers of colour, predominantly black barristers, 
who are not paid to do that work. We do it on top of our day jobs, and the majority of us are self-employed, so we actively lose money by dedicating time to it. We're not anti-racism experts either. So some of us are floundering, we don't have structures around what we're doing, we repeat the work that others are doing to try to bring about those changes, and it's all happening in quite a piecemeal, disorganised fashion. And so I think that one of the reasons why we're not seeing that change is we're not having honest conversations about racism. We're not centering the people who are actually the experts on racism to come up with the solutions. And we're not challenging ourselves to implement those changes because to do so would mean undermining a lot of the systems that we, that we need the public to have faith in to keep society going. If you start to outwardly accept the amount of racism that's present in not just the criminal legal system, because I think we revert to looking at that a lot. This report was highlighting racism in the judiciary. The judiciary cover all sorts of areas, not just crime. They cover actions against public authorities. They cover housing, immigration, all of these other areas. If you start to say, actually, the people who are the fabric of society, who hold these uh, areas to account, the lawyers who work in those courts, who are all subject to the same um, criticisms of racism as we level at the lower hanging fruit that is the police, then that undermines in many ways the institutions that we need people to have faith in to keep society going. So that, I think that's a, a big factor as to why this hasn't progressed in the way that it needs to. Katrina, I heard you... Um, um, no, I just was agreeing. Yes, yes, that's, that's what I heard. <laughs> that was just, just an agreement. Um, I, I, I don't need to come on on this, but I do want to say that it's an evolution of thinking um, that's needed, and I... Yeah, I've, I, I was an anarchist myself in my student politics days. I'm kind of still, but more of a compassion one and less of a fire one. <laughs> but just getting into the mind of blue sky thinking, a blank piece of paper and having civic spaces for people to discuss what should society look like and not having a top-down approach. And I know that sounds very fuzzy, but let's just empower ourselves to use the power we have. And I think we just don't do that enough because we want someone to come and say, this is how it needs to be done. Is there a, a challenge here, and I'm going to come to you, Graham, but of, of kind of uneven development in this kind of conversation? That you have some people who, for whatever reason, because of where their parents are from, because of their upbringing, because of their background, who have been living this stuff and educating themselves about this stuff, even if they're not experts, for years, then coming into contact with someone who's in their 60s has never really thought about it. And um, uh, a kind of a real a challenge to get on the same page when you haven't ever read the same books, you know. Um, uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine some of the conversations that you might be trying to have with people who at the very first sentence would be like, well, what? What, you know, what did I do? Oh, yeah, it happens all the time. So, for example, with the... I'll give you an example in court. The Modern Slavery Act that exists to highlight the existence of victims of trafficking, and once someone's identified as a victim of trafficking, you have to reassess whether it's in the public interest to actually pro prosecute them, even though they've technically committed a crime. Very often, the way that it's used is against people who are involved in drug supply. I raised... So, even just that, so that's not even necessarily an aspect of anti-racism work, but very often the people who are subject to these are young black boys. I raised this in Portsmouth, and I said, look, my, my defendant at the time was under 18. What was he doing living by himself, aged 15, in Portsmouth, you know, trafficking these drugs, like sat in this flat and cutting up Class A drugs? He's vulnerable, he needs to be assessed as a victim of trafficking, there needs to be some questions here. He's, you know, he falls under modern slavery. And the judge laughed in my face at the fact that I said the word slave. He, he was like, what do you mean slave? I was like, what do you mean, what do I mean slave? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was like, have you not read the legislation? Like, it's legally defined. Like, what do you mean? Like, why are you laughing at me? You're in Portsmouth. This is like a massive feeder town for County Lines activity. Your MP talks about it all the time. How are you 
as the judge of this court, not familiar with what the terminology is. But I'm so assuming that you couldn't say it like that because he's the judge. No, obviously I use my gosh voice. <laughs> right. No, well, no, I, I mean, <laughs> what I mean is how do, you, how do you kind of take that on? I said, to, I said to him, it's written in the legislation. I took him to the section of the legislation. I took him to the Home Office guidance. I took him to the CPS guidance. And because all of those things were written down in black and white, he paused... He didn't agree to refer it. He got the police officer to come in to justify why they hadn't made Sorry. a referral. And then I had to get my solicitor to go behind their back to, to get the Salvation Army to step in because they're one of the named um, first responders. So they could do their assessment. And we just kind of stalled the trial for as long as we could until we got the initial de um, decision from the Salvation Army to say that he may be a victim of trafficking. And on that basis... He adjourned the trial. But even though I took him to everything that was written down, so even when it's written down in black and white and it's there, unless, unless it resonates with them, exactly what you're saying, unless it resonates with them, he heard the word slave and he thought it was laughable because what he could see was a tall, fit, black guy who is now age 20 and he refused to see the vulnerability of him age 15 sat in the back by him, unfortunately. Yeah. So, Gary, one of your initial questions was, is the system capable of reforming itself or you know, does it need some sort of external stimulus? Um, it's kind of the design feature, really, of the criminal justice system, criminal legal system in uh, this country that all agencies are independent of one another. You know, the police are independent. The Home Secretary can't tell them what to do. Probably a good thing. CPS is independent. You know, the Attorney General can't tell us what to do, which is probably good because sometimes we prosecute MPs. Um, we, you know, the judiciary is fiercely independent and all judges are independent of each other, right? So everyone's got their independence and occasionally we all get it out and, you know, wave it around when we don't want to kind of be held to account for something. That's the big problem, I think. It's our independence that we're waving around. Well, I think what happens is you've got this dispersed system, lots of institutions, all of whom are independent. So when you're looking for that single point of leadership, mm -hmm. where is it, right? And you've got the Lord Chancellor, who's you know, Secretary of State for Justice, some control over the courts, but not judiciary. So everyone's kind of got their little bit of it, and nobody has the levers to make big change across the system as a whole. And then that leads to you know, one of the, the other points under discussion is, well, how do you then create change for the system when you're kind of one part of it. And you know, certainly for the CPS, you know, I've set it out earlier, we've got a lot of work that we need to do and we really want to do it. But a lot of that's going to necessarily need to involve policing or the judiciary. So we need them to come to the table ready to work with us with the same kind of spirit, the same endeavour, the same energy going into the issue. So you know, we can have our conversations with our you know, partners in policing and judiciary and we can seek to influence but we can't tell them what to do we can't make them uh, come to the table and prioritize it and one other thing that's come up that I'd quite like to address this point around um, people with different understandings of the the same issue this is one of the the big challenges for us within CPS so whenever you know we were working through our program of research that will hopefully tell us specifically where racism is manifesting right and what we can then do about it I've got an organisation of 7,500 people that I need to take with us on that journey. And they're all starting from different places. So, you know, we need to kind of bear that in mind. I, I absolutely accept that, you know, wholesale change is, is going to be necessary across the system. But we need to take our people with us when we do that. And uh, that necessitates, you know, real leadership, I would say. Um, I just want to give a chance for both Haroon and Katrina to come in. Go on. Haroon. So, yeah, I just wanted to say something very quickly about the independence issue, which I, I sort of agree, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> there's no way this government would have gone to the judiciary and said, you need to look at and become anti-racist, right? But, and at the same time as being independent, that certainly the last few years we've had a government where they want to kind of deny the existence of racism in society. And whilst the judiciary are independent, they're, they're not totally detached. 
It, it, so I'm, I'm not saying that the Lord Chief Justice would have prioritised anti-racism, but if he had wanted to, we've been in a climate where we see a lot of organisations from arts organisations to, you know, dare I say the equality watchdog downplaying racism. And so that's created a climate where even if the judiciary did want to tackle it, even if they did have someone really visionary at the top saying, you know, let's, let's sort our vote out, the minute they did it, they would have, you know, they would have come in for criticism from the current government. You know, whether that, whether there will be, I'm not saying that Labour will actively do anything, but even creating a climate where, you know, it's not, you, you can say the word racist and not be jumped on immediately, whether that will make a difference, I can only hope so. I mean, I, I started by talking about the McPherson report, which was a result of politics, right? There was an elect, well, at least an electoral change that had the Tories won in 97, I don't know that we would have had, I don't think we would have had a McPherson report. Um, and it, 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 was the, it, it, it was the commissioning of that report that gave space to a broader uh, conversation. So what's outside um, Katrina has an impact and you, you kind of, you stand in that nexus of, that, of, of outside. How do, how do you see it? I really want to just answer, I don't think it can be reformed because of some of the issues that you just raised. It's hot potato, nobody wants to take control, so it just everyone's allowed to be independently racist. <laughs> That's the truth, that it seems so. So I don't think it can be reformed because nobody... And I thought about this, when we, last year Unjust um, had a judicial review against the Met for its use of the gangs matrix, and we got to settlement negotiation stuff, my heart was beating, that's another story for another day, but what I realised was we settled that case because the Met had done some dirty stuff, like announcing things they said they wouldn't announce, but we didn't trust the judiciary would find that the Metrop Metropolitan Police was racist. So, you know, we thought, okay, we have them with the privacy staff, that seems quite clear cut, but if we really go into a room with the demographic that you described, Arun, are they really going to just, as soon as you hear gang, you just see hoodie. And then under the hoodie, you see mother. And all of the connotations that, unfortunately, the media, the full farm of the state have perpetuated means that we settled that case. And it wasn't because I truly believed the Met police were not institutionally racist for the last decade in how they've used the gangs matrix. It's because I had no trust that the judiciary would see it that way, even though we had the stats, we had the reports, we had, crime had not gone up with the, gone down with the matrix, it had probably even stayed the same or gone up in many ways. So I come back to it cannot be reformed by itself and there's a big role for civil society and just to be honest, not just the electorate, but citizens to decide how our society is designed. It's us, we are the people with the power. Why are we sitting waiting for people that there's less of us to decide how we shape the next five, 10, 15 years? I don't have the answers, but I know amongst ourselves we could probably come up with better answers than we've been given for the last few hundred years. And that's the role I would like for civil society to create spaces for people to come and convene to break bread and for us to have discussions about what does it look like? And not just about the problem, but about the solutions, and that takes time. It takes space, it takes money. It takes, it does, and it takes us to give our time and sacrifice it to come and sit in spaces where we don't know if we're gonna come out of an answer now, but we know that we're part of the, the team that are contributing to thinking of something new. So, unfortunately, <coughs> you guys are not gonna be able to reform much if you're depending on the judiciary or the police, because these institutions, I don't believe, see wholesale change as necessary. So, with that, I am going to open it up to civilians, if not the civil society. There's a live judge here. Yes. There's a live judge here. So, I think Claire, just, he can say anything she likes. They'll come after me and take me away and stop me. Okay, well, yeah, let's, you know, let's see if we can avoid that this evening. <laughs> um, um, you know, but we've all got our phones here, if that does happen. Are there, um, uh, I, I see you, are there any other um, people who want to ask any questions, um, because w w what I plan to do is put two or three to the panel and let them answer the ones they want. So um, if we take you first, uh, then you, and then you, madam, in the uh, red cardigan. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Um, President of the Judicial Branch, the GMB, 
which has just been established. Um, in 2019, I took the MOJ to court as a judge and won whistleblowing rights for judges. Within my complaints, there were my own observations of openly racist behaviour by judges. They were never examined, and they never made it into any media reporting either. Mm. Mm -hmm. Since that time, uh, my colleague Callie Cork, who's still sitting, and I set up the Judicial Support Network. We overwhelmingly receive disproportionate numbers of requests for support from, from judges from non-white or non-standard backgrounds. And the intersectionality of black factors in the RDB report is extremely strong. <coughs> the hierarchies within the judiciary are rigid and they prefer all the factors that have been mentioned, leading to, quite often, a very seriously under um, inadequate experience of the judge of the non-standard background, who can feel silenced, muzzled, uh, corralled, uh, and quite often forced out of the judiciary. Overwhelmingly, they are kept in the lower ranks. Overwhelmingly, the only people of the non-white, non-standard, um, female, etc., or people with disability uh, backgrounds who, who get promotion are those who agree to trade in their freedom of speech uh, for promotion. We get complaints from such, from such people. We get complaints that they have been picked on as a poster child to be put forward by the publicity machine mm -hmm. that sits at the centre of the Ministry of Justice as adverts for the, the diverse trade judiciary, but they find that they are censored and that they are silenced. When you are censored and you have not even been asked if you're censored, what impact does that have upon your future exercise of your freedom of speech? You make a choice. You shut up, you get on with it, you get promoted, and you don't say those things again. When, uh, Gary, you refer to complacency within the Ministry of Justice, it was rejection. The tone was set at the top. The RBB report was rejected. It was invalid. I am a troublemaker. I'm unrepresentative. <laughs> the tra there was a programme of training, which has not been mentioned, which was instituted in uh, the judiciary to meet the RBB. It is, of course, the only strand within the uh, strategy for diversion and inclusion, no, uh, diversity and inclusion uh, that uh, is referred to in the RBB report. So training is something they are always prepared to think about. But this is a, was a one-off programme of training, and uh, the experience that was reported to me of people who attended that training was that they were reduced to tears if they came uh, from a non-white background of triviality of the uh, material mm. and also the laughter mm. that sometimes greeted it. Mm. It's not true that we need revolution. I was the deputy chair of the IPCC when, the, when it was independent. Uh, I have seen the Met go down the hill <coughs> with its racist behaviour in the 20 years since that time. We are afraid that the judiciary will, if it is not forced to face up to these things, go downhill too. The proportion uh, of non-state educated people is increasing. The experience of uh, the non-white judge I've always, already referred to. Training the judges is not adequate to meet the need. So what do we need? We need the release of, of the report from Half the Sky about judicial uh, experiences of bullying and racism. We need everybody from the academic sector and the left-wing newspapers, please, not just the right-wing newspapers. We need your support. We need the support for the judges who are not racist, for the judges who want to speak freely, for the judges who want to use the right to whistleblow, which is a tokenistic policy now. We want you to ask for proper complaint procedures. We want you to ask the MOJ how many complaints are made by judges, how many are upheld, we want you to say to the uh, judicial hierarchy, listen to the Judicial Support Network, talk to us, recognise the GMB union, stop trying to undermine us, include us in your consultations on new policies, on, on um, uh, disciplinary processes. Don't exclude us. We are excluded as an organisation from commenting upon policies which affect us. Tackle the hierarchies and say to the top, you've got to set the tone. You may not believe that the um, judiciary is racist, 
but what many of your judges do think is racist. And hold them to account. But at the moment, this whole idea, notion of judicial independence, is far too broad. The judge in the court should be independent. The judge outside the court and the judge in management should not be independent. And should be asked what they're doing to tackle these problems and how to account. So it's not a question that they get. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, Haroon, you got your work cut out afterwards. Um, two uh, uh, quick contributions uh, or questions, because we are, um, no, 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 it was a very valuable contribution. Two uh, quick contributions or questions, you and you, and then we will go on to uh, Keir. Cool, thank you so much. And my name's Antonia. I've really enjoyed hearing everyone today. So my role is, um, uh, we'll work with young prison leavers, largely young black men, uh, advocating for change. Um, I wanted to ask uh, what your solutions were to getting public, uh, public more, more informed about the middle bit. Katrina, you, uh, you said something really interesting that people tend to think about policing and prison and kind of the sensible bit in the middle is often neglected, particularly with public information. And particularly in the media, there is a lesser court reporting, so the transparency around court reporting isn't there because there isn't funding. And particularly a culture at the moment where people often use media or social media to validate their opinion rather than maybe inform, and that might be a judgment. So. How do we get more people hearing about this? I'd also question that maybe the people in the room here already know what's in the report because we work in the criminal legal sector. So how do we inform the public of this for motivating change? Or have you ever seen any good examples of uh, informing people beyond our sector and beyond our industry? Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Um, yes. yes uh, I'm Gloria Marston. I'm the campaign coordinator for Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association. Um, I went to a trial once where the judge, uh, dad asked me to go because he was worried about the judge being the racist and uh, this trial was about six boys and they were relying on phone evidence just to convict them under a joint enterprise, ABH I think or GBH. The judge actually said they phone each other more than they phone their fathers. Oh, it's like uh, that, that disconnect to me that this judge had absolutely no idea what these young boys were like and why they were phoning one. The question was actually to Graham but I, I do want to try and bring it back around to the judiciary. Um, so the data, uh, the pilot data shows that across the seven CPS pilot areas, black people are 16 times more likely to be prosecuted on a secondary liability basis than white people. It also shows that a very worrying number of young people and some children are being prosecuted on a secondary liability basis. What do you think are the drivers of this? I'm not going to count because we were talking a bit about this earlier, but how much are we going to hold the judiciary to account for these massive trials of children, of young black boys, how much can we now start? Because they should be throwing them out. Okay. They should, they, a lot of them. And the CPS really need to take a big step up on this, that the CPS, you know, how they're going to hold the judiciary to account for the trials, that they know that, you know, the secondary liability, the secondary parties shouldn't be prosecuted. Okay, so I'm going to ask each of you to uh, make a response, and that this, will be, this will be your last word. I'm also going to beg you to keep it the big questions, but I need to keep it as brief as possible. Um, so Graham, yeah. respond to, to Gloria first. Well, first of all, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Joint enterprise is one of those areas where there is a very particular uh, problem with disproportionality. And, and you know, thank you to, to Jengba and colleagues for, for really ensuring that the CPS uh, look at that in, in some detail. Um, and we're very grateful to you also for the you know, continued uh, support for the work we're doing on that. There is an issue, I think it's very, very clear. We are um, currently doing a series of scrutiny panels where we work with Jengba and others to look at decision making in joint enterprise cases. Uh, that process will have an impact on uh, our guidance for prosecutors, uh, how we approach those cases. Uh, I think that the CPS needs to grip that uh, in a way that it hasn't previously. I think if we are serious about our kind of general efforts to you know, tackle disproportionality, then joint enterprise does need some special attention within that, and absolutely we will be doing so. More broadly, across the system, I would think that as, as a result of that process of scrutinising our casework, there will be things that the CPS needs to do differently, uh, and there will be things that our partners across the system will need to do differently. And where we identify those things, we absolutely will raise that with them. I'm going to kind of come to this lady's question about what can we do for the public. 
There's a Jamaican saying, who feels it, it's Caribbean, but being Jamaican, we claim it, but who feels it, knows it. And I think most of the public are just busy living, watching Netflix, doing the things that until you get in court or have something happen, you just don't think it exists. So over the last couple of years, we're thinking about how do we tie in with other coalitions? How do we present something? So is it about public safety and how actually we're not really that safe, not because judges are letting people out, because actually judges are perpetuating divisive language that separate us. How do we frame a narrative or work with other organisations? Because let's just be frank, running a, as a black woman, running a non-profit that looks at racial discrimination in the criminal legal system, as soon as I open my mouth, some people just get their briefcase and go about their business because they're just like, I've heard it all before. So there is having to be, I don't like the word cunning because it, it has a really, no, having to be really ingenious about how do we bring people along. So. You know, you're trying to bring 7,000, I'm trying to bring about 60 million around the whole country along <laughs> in terms of that conversation. But I think it is about breaking bread and space. And everybody in here should be telling a friend to tell a friend or having the conversation at the dinner table. It's not what you say at work, it's what you bring in your house, those values that you're sharing around the people you most love, that then share them with other people that we start to have critical mass. But if we're not sharing it with people and they're not sharing it, and we're just the only people, then I don't think we're going to get that kind of mass ripple, dare I say, tsunami, Hurricane Katrina effect that I'm looking for to just eradicate racial discrimination and have a society that's much more equitable and ha harmonious. Thank you. Uh, Abin Bell. Yeah, um, in terms of like public engagement, so it was really interesting because I was going to name Jengba as an organisation that I think has really brought people along in terms of highlighting an area that a lot of us lawyers knew about but actually wider communities didn't. And now that they have, then you have organisations like the CPS and so on who listen. Um, but, you know, the traditional answer is, oh, you know, people should take time to go to court and watch cases. But what I wanted to highlight was watching a case, even every day, is not going to make you more attuned to racism because cases look at things in isolation. They look at these individual kind of factual matrices and then they work within that area and that's why that's one of my frustrations when with my criminal practice was that you deal with the facts which are in front of you rather than the wider systemic issues in individual cases so it's actually like seeing the racism and being able to highlight the racism is really difficult because it all comes down to these kind of admissibility rules and so on I think that the the way for things to change it's first of all, we need a change in government. I think, secondly, we need people who actually think critically and don't think in clickbaits of 280 characters on Twitter and discuss things in that way. So I think we need to look at education, but not just education in schools, but ongoing education. I think we need better quality debate. I think we need better quality journalism on matters. Like, I am a fan of The Guardian. Um, so this is not about... You don't have to say there's that. A, there's um, a butt coming, isn't there? However... <laughs> however... <laughs> however... Um, you know, I would highlight that, you know, for example, with some of the work that Katrina and I have been doing with the Race Action Plan, with some of the work that Barristers Network does, we will email journalists and we will say to them, we've given you like a week-long embargo on this. This is the nuance of what we're discussing. We will make time to speak to you, discuss these points with you. We're running this event. We're doing this. We're doing that. They won't turn up or they'll print an article which is misleading in the headline, even if the content is is helpful or the content is just inaccurate but you know I just think that honestly the standard of discussion around race is really poor and so we need to see something being done about that so that people can be better informed and have better quality conversations in the first place like it's just kind of exhausting um, to be honest just entering those conversations initially um, so yeah I think those I think those would be the solutions around it. Hurry. Did did Gary Toad say that? Because I said I compared him to Matt Hancock. <laughs> no, you should you should both contact me directly in the future. But um, I think there's a problem with with justice generally from a journalist's point of view, in the sense that you know the Justice Department got its budget cut by 40% in a decade, right? Which other department would that have to happen to without there being, you know, people on the streets, health, education? Even defence, you know, which doesn't, you know, affect people's everyday lives. It's that, you know, I think the secret barristers talked about this fact that people, until they actually 
know someone who experiences it or goes to court themselves. You know, they don't care about it. And that's a big problem. And that feeds into newspapers too. You know, I'm pitching against uh, other, other um, specialisms that people are much more interested in. Uh, unfortunately, that readers are more interested in, and therefore my editors are more interested in. So, so it doesn't create the space to, to kind of talk about um, these, these issues in, in, in the same way. And I think uh, going to, back to sort of what Abin Boda said is that, you know, it's not about, yeah, we do have less court reporters and court people covering them, but it's not about individual cases. But I, w I was actually going to mention Jengba and Joint Enterprise too, because I think what you, what, those are the kind of issues that are kind of so blatant and, and, can, and so human that they can move people. I think, for example, you know, there's, there's very little calling, you know, stuff about racism and the judiciary in the papers, but, and, and, and the, my, but my colleague David Conn sort of followed the, the Moss Side case and, you know, he did a big piece about it. And, you know, he wasn't saying explicitly the judge is racist, but he was raising all the issues that, and, and that comes from the, pros, you know, the prosecuting decision to judiciary. So I think it is about finding those kind of thematic stories. I think in the same way that we've, I've found, um, you know, writing about prisoners, no one really wanted to hear about prisoners. And then IPP sentences is, re is something that's really resonated because it's got that human impact. You know, you read about it and you're really shocked. And I think, and there's been, admittedly, there's been a bit more focus on prisons recently, but it's only after the, you know, esca alleged escape from Wandsworth Prison and uh, the record of, of prison population. But I think in the same way, you need to find those issues and whether that's joint enterprise or another kind of thematic thing where, you, you know, you're not going to find the judge who's going to, you know, say something so... It, you know, horrific, you're, you're not going to find that, and then that's going to make that everyone go, oh, this is terrible, <laughs> the judiciary needs reform. You need to find those issues like joint enterprise, and, and, and you need to really focus on them. Thank you. Um, uh, we d there are um, questions from online. I'm afraid we just, I'm sorry, but we don't have time for those. We, um, I'm now going to introduce Kim on teas, and then we are going out for drinks and canapé, so this is all canapé time that we are uh, uh, literally and literally not eating into. Um, Keir uh, Monteith KC is a leading silk who represents clients facing heavyweight criminal allegations. Uh, Keir, th there is so much more that I could say about Keir, but I just want him to come up and talk. So Keir <laughs> is the co-author co of the report. I was going to say a little bit more. He co-authored the report, Racial Bias on the Bench. He's a Simon Fellow at the University of Manchester, and uh, he, he did the report with uh, Professor Ethne Quinn. Keir, please. Right, so we're going to start with a big round of applause for this panel and yourselves. I want to hear screaming in this audience. <laughs> Louder! Come on! Stamping of feet! Yeah, that's better. Um, and a big round of applause also for the people you don't see who are behind you, who are controlling and uh, manoeuvring me and some of the uh, panel, all, all the sound effects, and also Emma Richmond and Louise Elliott from Manchester University. So. <laughs> now, I, this evening, this evening, I am going to try and do something that a lawyer has never done before. I am going to try and speak for less than my allotted time. I can hear laughter for those online and some barracking from the front judge, which is something I experience day in and day out, but not from this judge. The panel's verdict is in the people's verdict is in. And a year on, those at the top of the legal system are guilty 
and they're guilty of not enacting RBB's recommendations. They are guilty of letting down all of those people who in 2020 and the decades before took to the streets to insist black lives matter. They have let down all the people who demanded a reckoning with the racism that underpins policing and the legal system specifically and society and its institutions more broadly. They've let them down. First heading, racial bias in the judiciary. I just want to start very briefly and underline this finding. Racial bias in the judiciary exists. Our report confirms this. You've been taken through those survey findings by Professor Quinn, but just take a moment, just take a moment to consider the eyewitness accounts from judges, from solicitors, from counsel who took time out from their busy lives to say in writing what they had seen. Eight themed subsections in our report, over nine pages, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Here, three quotes. One, I would have to write for pages and pages to express the racism I have seen. The tendency to always believe the police, I heard, why would the police lie more times than I can count? I practice in extradition and immigration, the problems often feel systemic. And I can tell you now, I'm upset when I read that stuff out. That should not be happening in a legal System, And if I had my time, we would pause. We would pause to let, that, let those three of so many sink in. But we're not going to pause. You know it. Other people need to pause. Uh, racial bias and institutional racism exists in the legal system. Sister and brother institution, the police. McPherson, Casey and Joe Farrell, the most recent appointment to police. Scotland. The ramifications for society, justice and democracy are severe. You can't have a fair trial. You can't hold others to account. You can't hold organisations to account. You can't hold the state to account if your judge is racially biased and or the system is institutionally racist. As a lawyer, you can't work effectively. You can't progress. You can't succeed if the system is institutionally racist. Leslie Thomas, he's here today. Leslie Thomas KC summed the situation up as follows. I take out one or two of the lines. Judges are some of the most powerful actors in our society. A judge may decide whether you lose your home, lose your state benefits, lose custody of your children. The judiciary is an institution. All institutions have ingrained patterns and behaviours, often, but not always, unconscious. As an institution, the judiciary can be racist. Next heading, crisis. Part of the reason for the, the present criminal court and prison crisis is institutional racism. Too many black defendants prosecuted under joint enterprise. Too many black people locked up for longer than their white counterparts. In a case I am currently appealing, the total sentence was 168 years for one murder. 168 years for one murder. My clients 
all good character. That upsets me. All ten defendants, black and mixed race. Racial bias in the bench was the first academic report that investigated and published on this issue. Frankly, it should have happened decades ago. We looked at both racism and anti-racism, and it's no surprise that our fair and balanced approach has resulted in so many positive endorsements and promises, promises underlined in bold, promises from stakeholders, as they call themselves, in the legal system. Endorsements and public statements. All three authors of the report were invited for a meeting with the previous Lord Chief Justice. Uh, in November 2022, he publicly stated he would take the RBB into account and also discuss it with the Diversity Committee. That's the full big public quote on the screen. We invited the new LCJ here. Actually couldn't come, but we hope to meet her soon. So we can get cracking on the work that urgently has to be done. The report has been endorsed by the Law Society, nine independent experts who contributed to a supplementary report on the Equal Treatment Bench Book. It's been raised in Parliament, in select committee meetings. The lead authors have been invited to speak to the Ministry of Justice, Mind, and it was featured in a podcast on Apple and Spotify by Transform Justice, which had more listeners in the first 24 hours than any previous episode. Yeah. Can you, uh, yeah? Thank you. Right. What an audience. Uh, it's even been recommended uh, uh, reading for judges on the reverse mentoring scheme. The Ministry of Justice feedback was positive. I was told that the staff I spoke to found it, quote, very insightful. I actually saw real hope from the Ministry of Justice meeting, but I'm concerned that if the system doesn't change, as those staff members progress through the ranks, then the pernicious effects of institutional racism will take hold and we will end up where we are now, in a situation where no one high up openly talks about racism in the justice system. David Lammy took time out to meet myself and Professor Quinn and publicly stated that action to embed compulsory anti-racist and racial bias training for all judicial office holders, which is a key recommendation of the report, would encourage a culture shift towards anti-racist practice. Annalise Dodds MP also recognised the importance of the report and the need to end structural race inequality. She said our recommendations will be considered. We hope they are adopted. Media coverage, the media coverage has, as you can see on this slide, been extensive in capitals, all positive and importantly has led to an open discussion about the challenges the legal system faces and the issue of institutional racism. Next steps, we need, we have to harness all of these endorsements, engagements, and promises in bold underlined. I, I'm going to highlight three recommendations from our report. Number one, our first recommendation was for the Lord Chief Justice to publicly acknowledge institutional racism in the justice system, in the legal system and redraft the five-year strategy, which Professor Quinn talked about. Read that strategy, try and find the word racism. It's not there. And it's still not there. The second re recommendation was to organise compulsory and ongoing high-quality racial bias and anti-racist training for all judges and key workers in the justice system. Anecdotal, and maybe now, as we had 
uh, from Claire this uh, evening, direct evidence is that the present new training is not working. In fact, it's worse. And there's nods from the front. It's worse. And that's something that we highlight, that the dangers of um, bad training um, can have as an impact. And importantly, this new, quotes, training is based and relies on an inaccurate, and maybe that's a polite word, uh, judge's textbook on equal treatment. Again, you heard Professor Quinn talk about that. I'm going to fast forward to number six, the sixth recommendation, where we asked that the equality textbook for judges, the ETBB, be rewritten, foregrounding the importance of combating institutional racism, in particular the neglected area of racism against black people in the courts. It also needs to start from a recognition, this isn't radical, a recognition that judges, like everyone else, have socially and psychologically ingrained biases that they need to understand and challenge. I know some of the editors are with us tonight, and we hope that they will take all that has been said on board and adopt our recommendations in full. It's literally the very least that can be done. Fast forward to page 15, in between are the findings and the recommendations. But this sums it up in just two sentences. Meaningful solutions have been proposed by us and many others. What has remained lacking is the political will to publicly acknowledge that institutional racism in the justice system exists and to make the changes that not only address this toxic problem, but have knock-on benefits in building a fairer, more resilient, more democratically accountable judiciary. The people at the top have had a year, and they are way behind the curve. They need to take the initiative and get cracking on our recommendations. No more reports from us. Just action. Part of that action, after listening to this brilliant panel and you, is just talking. Talking about racism because people seem to have a problem with that. And listening to the people that are talking about institutional racism and then doing something about it. And it's everyone, it's judges, it's lawyers, it's campaigners, it's journalists talking about the problem and listening. And the action will get stronger each year because I'm tired. I'm tired of the lack of change. We in this room and outside this room are tired of the lack of change. But we're not going away until the system is changed. If you want a copy of these slides, we can provide them on the last page. As you can see, everything you need in three simple links. Now, it says here, for the record, I came in one minute early and now feel guilty as I've set a dangerous precedent that lawyers can speak for less than 10 minutes. Where will it end? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Keir. It just leaves to me to thank you so much for coming, to thank our panel, to thank Keir and uh, Ethnic for uh, uh, the report. I think it's been a great evening. Um, 
Let's go out and make some trouble. Thank you. Um, there, are, there are drinks and uh, uh, canapes outside, I think, so please help yourself. <laughs>